Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the Street Epistemology Workshop. I'm so glad to see some familiar faces, some new faces, and people that have come in from, from, the, from the, the hallway there, or people that stuck around from the Atheist Experience in Talk Heathen. I uh, really enjoy those shows, and I'm really glad to see so many people here to learn street epistemology. Um, before we get into this, I want to just give you a little bit of a background about myself. I'm just going to take a couple minutes because I suspect many people probably already know my story and are somewhat familiar with street epistemology, but I think it's important just to get into it. When I first came to like grips with my atheism, I was arguing, debating, and jeopardizing relationships with my friends and family. And I was really excited when I discovered street epistemology because I think it's a really good way of engaging with people in a respectful way and maybe even a more effective way in certain venues. So I'm very excited to be sharing it with you today. I've given probably a dozen workshops, like hands-on, roll-up-your-sleeves workshops across the country and even internationally, and probably close to 50 presentations on this subject. I've been going on for about six years and recording conversations with people where I attempt to use this method that I want to share with you today. And I'm very excited to be here. This is really awesome to be here. This is my second time being on stage at American Atheist. I was here last year. Yeah? Remember that? So, thank you. So in Oklahoma City, I gave a talk about how I see street epistemology being crucial to the future of atheism. I think it's a wonderful tool. And I gave a talk. It's on the American Atheist YouTube channel. We even had some volunteers transcribe it, add captions in like 12 different languages or something. So please check it out if you haven't already. Oh, and a quick survey. Show of hands, who here is somewhat familiar with street epistemology already? Show of hands, wow. That is amazing. Holy crap. <laughs> I would say roughly we got like maybe three-fifths of the hands I think went up. That was really great. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, that actually helps me kind of customize this, this, uh, this workshop a little bit. So I'm not getting into two of like the basics. And we can make it more advanced, more useful to you. So we have less than 90 minutes. We've got a lot to cover. Here are the objectives. This is what I'd like to achieve here. Uh, I'll spend a little time explaining what street epistemology is and isn't. We'll talk about a model that's like a, a visual representation of street epistemology. And then I want to show you an example. I don't think that there's a better way to explain what street epistemology is than for you to, than for you to actually watch an example. Whether you're just observing a, like a face-to-face -face conversation or you're watching a video that somebody uploaded, or maybe you're hearing a story about somebody who used the approach. And then we're gonna practice it. I'll, with, with a group this size, it's a little bit difficult to just have people yell out answers, but I'll flash up a couple of real world scenarios on the screen. Things that we hear from people all the time, opportunities to engage with them using this method. And we'll do a little role play too. I'll get into that. And then at the end, I think there's gonna be times for, for some questions and answers, which in my view is the most valuable part of this where you can tell me what your, what your worries are, what your concerns are, what you like about this, et cetera, and we can address that or, or clear up any misunderstandings. All right, so let's, get, let's start with a definition of street epistemology. I guess I would define it as, I guess I would define it as something like a way to engage in a dialogue with somebody where you're listening to them and challenging them in a respectful manner with questions. And as tempting as it might be to, to want to debate with them or tell them that they're stupid or give them facts or whatever, it's, it's holding back on sharing your view for the purpose of the discussion. And then when they're ready to hear your side of it, you can engage with them. It can be a back and forth. So street epistemology is about listening, asking, repeating, steel manning even. What's, what's the best argument for thinking that something is true? and then listening to them, repeating it back, et cetera. But yet challenging them with very good questions, getting down to the, the, the foundation that's propping up these views that people have. What is, street, what is not street epistemology? I guess I would say it's, um, it's certainly not evangelizing. Like if you, you caught the tail end of the atheist experience where Matt was explaining, like it's not, it's not going out and, and, and trying to push a worldview. Now I think you can use street epistemology to get people to a point where they realize that they don't have a good reason to think something is true, and then that's a ripe opportunity to push your worldview. It can be done. However, 
it seems like that's where the street epistemology stops and then maybe the, the, pr the promotion of another point of view begins. What else is it? Well, the street part, a lot of people think you go out on the street and do these talks. You don't have to go out on the street and do it. I hope everyone realizes that by now. But the most vivid examples of street epistemology are the videos that are being uploaded to YouTube. So I understand how people get to, get to that impression. All right, a little bit more background here. This started with a book called A Manual for Creating Atheists by Dr. Peter Bogosian. And I read the book and I was skeptical because he was purporting that, hey, if you ask questions rather than debating and you get down to their methodology, which might be faith, if somebody discovers that it's unreliable, you might help them abandon that belief. And I thought, that's just too easy. That's just too easy. How? And, and the examples were lacking. So I went out and I tried to record conversations and upload those. And now what started happening is that communities began to form. We have a vibrant Facebook group with over 5,000 people in it. We have a Discord server, Reddit. We're, we're everywhere. There's a vibrant community of people who love this. They may not necessarily do it or feel comfortable doing it, admittedly, but they like what they're seeing, and they're giving us some very good feedback. And as a result of the communities, we have people who are practicing it in real life, whether they're going out on the street with a camera or they're waiting till they're in their Uber and the driver says something or whatever. Or maybe you're home for the holidays, and rather than arguing with your family, you can use this approach and possibly make some progress. Now, what's really exciting, we've been at this for about six years since the book came out. We are in the process of starting a 501c3 for street epistemology. It will be called Street Epistemology International. It will be a, a nonprofit where you can donate, and we'll make sure that the funds you provide get in the hands of people who want to promote this method worldwide. So we're very, very excited about that. Yeah. All right, so yesterday, yesterday, uh, Dr. Hector A. Garcia, who's a good friend of mine, gave a talk, and he said this. He said, fear is what keeps us from questioning, and my jaw dropped, and I was like, that's, that's so right. And I jotted it down on my phone, and uh, that's, that's exactly what we tend to see. And I think that was one of the, one of, uh, one, a, a genesis of street epistemology was the recognition that, you know, if we give people evidence on a view that's very tied to their core, to who they are, it could be a little jarring. It could be a little scary. We might even ignore the evidence. Uh, there's this phenomena that may or may not be a thing, it seems like it is, called the backfire effect, where if I give somebody evidence who thinks that, let's say that they think that the Earth is 6,000 years old, and I give them evidence that clearly shows that it's not, they might ignore my evidence and then double, renew their efforts to believe what they believe even more. That's the backfire part of it. Well, interestingly, if you put people in fMRI machines and ask them questions that contradict something that they think is true, especially something that they're very invested in, areas of their brains seem to light up that correspond with areas of the brain that would light up if they were under a physical attack or they spotted a bear in the woods. So Hector's quote really is very spot on, I think. I think that that's right. All right, so when we're engaged in street epistemology, and epistemology is such a weird word. My recommendation is when you hear that word, think of method or methodology. But I can't really give a workshop on street epistemology with it, without first explaining a couple of different epistemologies. So epistemologies are ways that people are going about figuring out what they can claim to know. That might be a little kludgy. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. These are methods or ways people are using to conclude that something is true, generally. And this is the main focus of street epistemology. You're gonna see very, very shortly, we're moderately interested in what they think is true and why, and yet it's the method, it's the epistemology that they're using that we wanna focus on with these questions. A Couple of examples might be, I feel it strongly in my heart that it's the case, or my mom told me that that's the case. She's never lied to me before. I mean, maybe once or twice, but I trust her. So that's my epistemology. Or I read something on, on, uh, online, or maybe I watched a really powerful documentary. These are all different ways people are using. Maybe you roll a die. Sometimes you use faith. Sometimes faith itself could be 
in epistemology. It could be a method for concluding that something is true. Epistemologies are very slippery too. Very often when you're just getting down to the foundation or the, the, or the, the method that they're using, if you're not careful, somebody might shift gears and start talking about the value they get from the belief or what it is they think is true. Or let me tell you the story that happened that was so profound to me. So it's very important that we keep focused on the, that bottom level. And lastly, it's efficient. So think about it. If we had a conversation with somebody who discovered that faith was an unreliable way to conclude that something is true, and maybe we were talking about ghosts, all right, or God, or whatever, or any other epistemology, if somebody discovers that that epistemology is faulty, they probably have other beliefs that are based on that faulty method. So if you can discover a faulty method or a, or a suspect method or an unreliable method, it's conceivable that other beliefs that people hold are also, people might have 50 to 100 beliefs based on faith. Okay, so by targeting the epistemology, you can really be causing a person to think about a whole bunch of views that they have. When I first started doing street epistemology, I thought I'd go out, have a conversation with a street preacher, and they would like come to their senses that they were believing something that wasn't true, and they'd stop street preaching. And I was like sh shocked when I went out the next week, and they're still out there. So I think you have to be a little bit realistic with this approach. Uh, largely, it's about putting a pebble in a person's shoe or putting a book on the shelf, you know, and then another book goes on the shelf, and be before long, the shelf breaks, or you have to address the, the bulging shelf. I think it's also important to get consent, too. Make sure that you ask a person if you can challenge their view, I think. Now, sometimes we just jump into it before we know it. We're, we're doing street epistemology, but it seems, it seems to be kind of effective. And, and I think the video examples kind of bear that out and some of the anecdotes that we're getting back. So I'd lean more towards giving a person a heads up that you want to challenge them about their views. Okay, give them a heads up. Give them time to process it as well. I think a lot of the change that happens is after the conversation when a person is home and they're thinking about those great questions that you asked. And I didn't really do a really good job of answering that. And maybe it, what, what would it look like if that wasn't true? That's where the work occurs. And then try to figure out a way to follow up with them if you can. All right, so uh, this, is, this is a shout out to Bart Campolo because he's been, he's been watching my presentations and so forth. He says, you never talk about what motivates you to do this. So Bart, this, is, this slide is for you. I guess I should start off by saying that what I'm going to explain is my motivations may differ from other people who do this. And my motivations can vary in the, in the midst of a conversation. So I might be having a conversation. I'm, a, I'm originally starting off with just saying, I want to just understand what it is you think is true, why, and, and what the method is you're using to conclude that those reasons are good. But then it might become apparent that maybe they thought about it a little bit more. I, I just uploaded a video two days ago with a guy where it seemed like he's given it a lot more thought. Well, my motivation changed a little bit to see, well, let's talk about what your life might be like without this belief. So I guess your motivations for why somebody might use this approach can vary. Somebody might go out and say, I want to change minds. I think gods are made up. I think it's harming society. And that's my motivation. That's fine. Street epistemology is a tool that can be used for a lot of different things. I do also think it's important, and this is, this is one thing that I found developing in myself when I was going out and having these talks, is you find, you find having more empathy for the people that you talk to. You come to like, you start to sort of realize that uh, there's a lot of people walking around with beliefs that they don't have good reasons for, including myself. So it's, it's humbling at the same time where you, you, you gain empathy. And it seems like I've had so many people, just a couple anecdotes, at least a dozen people came up to me in the last two days to say, I've been watching street epistemology videos, I've been learning the method, I found myself in a situation, this person really thought about it, it was the best conversation that we've ever had on the topic, and I'm finding it changing me. It's changing the way that I see other people in a more positive way. I'm not as angry, I'm not, as, I'm not as that angry atheist that I used to be. I'm kind of backing off on that. I can, I can kind of relate to the person now. And that is fantastic. And I also think that this could be a good way to figure out what's true. 
Or at the very least, did I use a shaky method for getting to that conclusion? So we might want to back off of our certainty. Here's a visual representation of, of SE. Have you guys seen this before? I've, I've, I've hauled this out every once in a while. So how do we get to this? So a volunteer took some videos and transcribed them, and I started reading the transcriptions, and I noticed that we spent a little bit of time. That's why the, the, top, part, the top part there claim, that is the starting point. Okay, and it's kind of small. Like it, this is sort of relative to the, to the other three, the other two. There, we're somewhat interested in the claim that a person's making. Okay, um, here's another way of looking at it. Yeah, what, why, how? So this is basically the same chart represented differently. It's interesting how you have to be kind of flexible in this. And this is also nonlinear. So what I mean by that is you can engage in a person. I actually had a conversation with an atheist a couple years ago on a college campus who said that he thought that karma was real, like um, not human observed and then reenacted out type of karma, but like some sort of cosmic judge. We were at the what level. He was explaining what he meant by karma. And then like after 30 seconds, he's like, that's bullshit. I don't believe that. So just him explaining what it was he thought was true, and we, we were done, right? The conversation was over with. But usually we jump, we go through the top. We, we talk about what they think is true, why, and then the reasons or the how. All right, so what usually happens at the what level? And I think this will be important because when we, when we go to our role play sessions where we break up into teams, and do you guys have handouts? Most of you should have handouts. If not, just raise your hand. We'll bring some to you. Okay, there's a few more there. You do kind of want to start with what? You need to have a claim before you can use street epistemology on it. Okay, it seems kind of, kind of intuitive. So you need a topic, and it is kind of helpful, I think, to get a sense of how confident they are. So the, the gentleman that I was just referring to a couple days ago on that video, he reported that he was 70% confident that Jesus was real. It's a useful number, even if it's self-reported and it's subjective, and he might even report a lower number or a different number by the end of the talk. It's a good way to get an assessment of where they're at. If you said, I'm 100% sure, or I'm, I'm like at a six, I've really been questioning a lot lately, it could be a really useful number. Also at the what level, I think is important to define words. So if they say they think God is real or karma is real, ask them to define it. Just like my friend who, who was defining karma and in the process realized how silly it sounded, get a person to explain what it is they think is true. So the second level here, we tend to get hung up on this too. Um, many people see this as an opportunity to give their story. Let me tell you this, the wonderful miracle that I, that I experienced. And sometimes we have to sit through a 10 or 15 minute you know, explanation of that. But make sure, make sure that the reasons that they're giving for thinking that something is true is really the reason Ask them for their main reason. And sometimes they might give a reason. It was just the first thing that they can think of, and it really wasn't the main reason. So be flexible. And don't just say, well, I'm sorry. No, nope, you said miracles so that we're not going to anything else. No, don't do that. And watch for false leads. So you can ask them. If they say, I'm 100% confident that Allah is real. Okay, interesting. And what's your main reason for thinking that that's true? Well, the Quran really corresponds with science. Okay. You can ask them, was your confidence less, you know, before you heard that argument or before you found that argument compelling, did your confidence increase when you discovered that the Quran supposedly corresponds with science? And if they say, well, no, uh, that's a good way to kind of figure out if that had any bearing on their confidence that the belief was true. Another thing to say is, let's say that one day you came to realize that the Quran really didn't correspond with science. I'm not saying that that's what's happening, but let's, let's say maybe it happened. Would your confidence drop? And they might say no. And if they do, there's probably something else propping this up. But if they say yes, then you know, okay, we have a candidate here. We have something to talk about. We spend a lot of time talking about reasons. We, st we spend a lot of time arguing about reasons that people have for thinking something is true. And it's not even the reason why. So we can exhaust ourselves giving them evidence for evolution when they would still be just as confident that their God was real if evolution could be shown to be true to them. 
But this is the key. This is the target. This is what we're after in these street epistemology conversations generally is what's holding all this up? How are you confirming that these reasons are the main reason why you think something is true? How did you confirm that? What method did you use? Was it reliable? Could we use it for a different claim, a competing claim, and also conclude that that's true? If so, maybe it's not as reliable. What better ways might be out there? Is there a way that we can test this claim? If karma really is true, it'd be interesting to devise some sort of test to be able to demonstrate it, wouldn't it? Okay. All right, so you guys have been very patient listening to that. I really appreciate that. I'm going to show this video. This is with two ladies that uh, I think I filmed this about a month and a half ago. And it's not about God. We were, we were talking about something else. And normally I, I sort of do one-on-one -on -one conversations with camera and I get a person's consent. In this instance, there were two ladies there. And one of them offered to be my assistant. And this one starts, it's about seven minutes long, but it starts about 20 minutes into the conversation. So we've built rapport. They're more comfortable around me. They're really into it. And I think this makes for a really good example. And the, this, the purpose of this workshop is to teach you street epistemology. So I thought, well, let me show you a video of somebody being taught street epistemology, right? Like you watch it, and it might actually help you here. So here we go, and the topic is parentage. I will say that I'm a mom's uh, daughter. Like, uh, you're a mom's daughter. No, I'm my, my mom. Oh, this is the claim that you're willing to make. Yeah. Okay, this could be fun. My mom is my mom, and I'm. I see. There's an individual who you call mom, mm -hmm. and you think that she's really your mom. Okay. We can explore that. So what do you think would be a good first question to ask your friend here about her claim? What makes you think that she's your mom? Excellent question. Because she gave birth to me? How do you know? Because she gave birth to me. Mm -hmm. How do you know that that's the case? Yeah. Great question. Um, she has pictures that she was carrying me when I was a baby. And, um, I mm. have like body structures that like look like hers. Mm, mm. Interesting. I'm wondering how sure you are on a scale from zero to 100 that this is real and true. Where 100% would be there's no question in my mind, there's no doubt. And zero would be all I have is questions, all I have is doubt. I'm 100% sure. You're 100% sure that the woman who you are calling your mom really is your biological mother. Okay. What do you think about her 100%? Um, I don't know. What do you mean? Do you think a person could be 100% about anything? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Do you think there's any chance whatsoever that your friend could be mistaken? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So what would be a good question to ask your friend here to gently challenge her claim that the woman that you think is your mom, it really is your mom. First, you say your body structure, right, is the same as your mom's. And there is plenty of people in the world. And I'm pretty sure if you just go in the mall, you could get somebody who <laughs> looks exactly like you and put there, and they might think they look like their mo your mom, right? So that, why does that make you... Why does that make you think that, you know, you're your mom's daughter just because mm. of you? Great question. Can you repeat back her question to make sure that we conveyed it to you properly? Yeah. What do you think she just asked you there? Um, Cause like out there there's someone who looks exactly like my mom and I look exactly like them. So I mean, my mom may not be my mom cause I look like someone else's um, mm. daughter. Okay. And what do you think about her her raising this potential monkey wrench in your hypothesis that you're 100% sure that this is actually your mom? She may be right because I've been around people who look like me <laughs> and people think that they're my siblings or that's my mom or something like that, mm. you know? So her, her question has a little bit of merit to it. It might not be, I mean, we're not 
I'm not trying to harsh your mom here or anything yeah. or, or your heritage or whatever, but I think it is a fair question. There are other people that could very well look like your mom. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was one of the reasons why you think that she really is your mom is because, well, she look, you have characteristics of her. Mm -hmm. And if there are other people that could have those characteristics, is that a really good justification for being 100% sure, you can't be mistaken on this, that she's really your mom? What's that? Isn't that like a good justification? I say what? I'm, it's not a good justification. That's not a good justification yeah. for being 100% sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's revisit her level of confidence of being 100% sure that the woman who claims to be her mom really is her mom in reality. Do you want to ask her a question to challenge her confidence level now in a respectful way? Um, hmm. And you're being a really good sport here too, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Oh my God, I don't know. Can you give me like a hint? How about something like, um, you mentioned that you were 100% sure and you couldn't be mistaken. Now that we've had this talk, where are you at now with regards to your certainty that this is true? Mm. Maybe something like that? So when he asked, on the scale to zero to 100, you're like, I'm 100% sure, right? Mm -hmm. But when I say that there are people who look like your mom and they, you could be their daughter instead of your mom's daughter. And you were like, oh, she's right. So are you still on the 100? I'm on 99.9%. Like 99. <laughs> 99. <laughs> okay. Or 98. But like, if I do a DNA and we have the same blood, then she's my mom. Okay, so it sounds like what, what you were saying is that 100% certainty on this particular claim, even though it's fairly likely to be, to be true, 100% certainty might not be the most accurate spot to be because of the very reason that your friend here mentioned. And then you were saying, well, I might actually find something that could bring me up to 100. Yeah. But now you, you got me wondering if it really would, because now I'm thinking, if you did a DNA test, it could be an indication that there are other family members that could be the candidate and not really the woman who's saying that she's your mom. So I'm wondering, would that still, would that move you to 100, a DNA test? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> nah. Oh. I don't know. So I, I really appreciate you thinking about it. And that kind of reflectful thinking is exactly what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And moving off of a ledges of certainty, like I'm 100% sure that this is true. Well, after a few questions, you change your mind. maybe I'm willing to be a little bit more open to the possibility that I could be mistaken on mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And I thought that was a really good example of, of how to go about doing that. Mm -hmm. And you were fantastic. You were natural Thank at this, you. by the way. Okay. Noella Hafsa. They did all the work, basically, right? That was so cool. A couple of things, did you notice the tone of the conversation? It was fun. It was fun exploring uncertainty, even something very very personal about like, oh, you know, how dare you question me about my mom? But we turned it into a very fun exercise. And what I, what I thought was really cool was how uh, the, the woman on the left really asked some good questions and the woman on the right was really thinking about it. She was being honest and open. And that's what I think made the conversation really good. And just a little, um, little side note, after that dialogue, this is on my channel, uh, Noella, the woman on the left, was mentioning how the woman on the right, Hafsa, they were just coming down the stairs right before they ran into me. And they were having a discussion about Hafsa's career choice. And, and the woman on the left said, you know, this kind of questioning might be really good for helping us figure out if she's studying the right thing here at school. And they were really grateful for, for having had the conversation. And so much now, SE, I think, Street Epistemology, is about passing along this toolkit to people. Yes, it's great for, for interrogating the friendly version of that, uh, the woman on the right's parentage, but the lasting effect would be giving them that tool so that they can use it when they go out and get jobs, or if they're trying to figure out what career to get into. They will probably have a leg up if they grasp this technique. 
in their future jobs. Um, I do have some good news. I was asked by American Atheists to put together a toolkit for the regional and state directors of American Atheists. And uh, this is the draft version of it. I think we're going to beta test it a little bit first before we get approval and, and so forth. But I've taken all of, the, all of the learnings over the last six years of doing this and I boiled it down into a 10-page toolkit. So you folks can learn this and roll it out to your groups and so forth. And maybe one day we'll make it public, I don't know. As I was putting it together, I was like, this is a book, this is a book, this is a book. But it's, it's dense, it's useful, and I think you can really get some value from it. At the end of this toolkit, there are six dialogues, written dialogues, and then we have a video example, like a, a companion video to go along with it to really drive home the point. So if you are a regional or state director, you might want to keep an eye out for that. Okay, so with a room this large, it's a little tough to practice where I ask you for, for uh, your feedback. So I'm going to just, I'll sort of just take you through these. But I want to throw five real world examples up on the screen, things that we typically hear and how we can use street epistemology to suss our way through those claims. All right, here's a very basic one. And I've got the little, got the little models here. Uh, we found the leak and it's going to cost you 500 bucks. Well, a good, a good what-related question might be something like, well, what do you exactly mean by leak? Okay. Uh, well, it's uh, when, you know, it's, it's a little dripping, little, you know, little, you'll notice it. Like, if you, if you don't do anything with it, like in 24 hours, you'll notice a puddle. Okay. And why exactly do you think that I have a leak? Well, when I go under the cabinet and I shine my flashlight, I see water dripping from underneath the, uh, from the drain. Okay. And how did you conclude that the parts that you plan on putting in there are actually going to fix the problem? How did you conclude that, that this leak is actually being caused from the thing that you... This can actually save... You might actually notice people backing off of things that they're trying to sell you if you use this approach. This is a really good way to be less gullible about the interactions that we have. And it's friendly, too. And if you ask a few questions like this, maybe the next time he goes to a customer, she, he and offers the same repair, maybe he'll remember you and the questions that you asked and maybe be a little bit more careful the next time he quotes somebody. Here's another one. <laughs> this crystal has special healing powers. Okay, so a good what question would be, well, what exactly do you mean by healing powers? And they might say, well, you might go to bed with the worst headache, but when you wake up, you're gonna be so refreshed. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. But if they say, well, no, if, if you go to your doctor and they say you have a fatal illness and it's healed within the next month of wearing this crystal, then that's what I mean by healing. So figure out what they mean by that. And again, just them explaining what they think this crystal can do could impart doubt. It could place a pebble and they might completely rethink things. But keep drilling down. Keep going to what they think is true, why they think it's true, and how they concluded that that's a good reason. So they might say... Well, the reason I know that this is true is because my back was hurting for the longest time and I put on this special, it, it cost me $1,500, but it's jade and it's just, it shines in the light. And my, wouldn't you know, my back problem went away like within 48 hours of wearing this. You have a why. But the toughest questions and the most important questions when it comes to this approach is the method and the how. How did you conclude? Don't contest that their back is not hurting anymore. It probably isn't. Okay, don't call them a liar. But <laughs> the more important question is, how did, you determine, how did you determine that it was the crystal that was the result of your back not hurting anymore? Okay, how questions are much more challenging to answer and to be able to adequately demonstrate. And they're very, very useful for helping a person reflect on their views and lowering their confidence and perhaps even abandoning their belief. Okay, I'm sure everyone here has heard this one. I'll say a prayer for you. A good what question would be, well, what exactly do you mean by prayer? Why do you think prayer works? How could we tell if you said a prayer for, you know, if you said a prayer for me, how could we tell that the prayer was the result of me getting better or me passing my test? And again, let them do the work. Be respectful. Hear them out. Get their definitions of words and so forth. So I couldn't stand up here in front of American Atheists and not use this example. So I'm playing to the crowd here, I guess, with this one. Uh, God is real. What exactly do you mean by God? And you will, 
you will likely be amazed. I'm sure you already ask people this. And people have all sorts of different definitions of what they mean by God. So figure out what they mean. Get a degree of certainty or confidence that it's true. If they push back on that, don't worry about it. You'll probably be able to discern from the way that they're talking how confident they are that their belief is true. Why do you think God is real? What's your main reason why? Was that always your main reason why? If that reason wasn't available to you, if you came to realize that wasn't a good reason, would you drop your confidence? Figure out what their main reason why and then shift to the big one, the third level, the most important one. How did you conclude that that reason is valid? Could somebody use that same reason and conclude something is completely different? Okay. This is the part of the presentation that I'm not quite sure how it's going to go. It's always different, and the larger the crowd, the more chaotic it is. So bear with me and let me explain, if you would, let me explain all the, the little tips here before we break up into teams and do this, okay? Um, first of all, I have a handful of assistants who are walking around with this button that says, ask me about street epistemology. Uh, raise your hands if you, you're one of those folks. Okay, if we talked beforehand and you were going to be my assistant but you don't have one of these, there, um, see Chris up here in the front in the orange shirt. Okay, so there are people that will be dedicated to walking around and helping you during the role play. However, some people don't want their help and sometimes the help that we offer is not helpful. So they're not gonna just interject themselves but if you need help, raise your hand and somebody will come by to help you if you get stuck. This will be also be very noisy. It's going to be chaotic in here, so you know, just deal with it as best you can. I'm going to have a timer that I'll, I'm going to hold up my iPad with like a five-minute countdown. We're going to do two sessions of this also. So um, I'll be doing a countdown, and maybe we can flash the lights at the five-minute mark. I didn't set that up beforehand, so hopefully we can do that. And rather than spend time having you pick the, the what, why, and the how. In some instances, I've got them picked out for you. Because I think a group this size, it's gonna be easier for the assistants if we're all on the same page with what we're talking about. But the idea here is to give you practice where you're going to be the person making the claim in one instance, and then we'll switch roles and you'll be the person asking the questions. And if you look at your sheet, this is critical. This is your roadmap. And I have to thank Georgia for giving me this idea. Um, because I've done this before and they're like, it really would be nice if you had something written down <laughs> to make this easier for us. Well, now you have it. This will give you, and it's separated into, into two parts. I think the top part is tips for the person asking questions and the bottom part is tips for the person making the claim. So there will be ideas here. Just so very quickly, for role play one, which will be five minutes, we're not gonna start yet, don't get started just yet. The claim will be, I think ghosts are real. The reason that you give for the person making the claim, just be creative and come up with something, okay? And then uh, for your method or how you validated that that's a good reason, be creative and come up with something. And then for the second one, American Atheist, we're gonna do this one. The claim will be, I think God exists. For the reason why you think God is real, be creative, come up with something. Maybe something you used to say when you were a believer. But for the method, I'd like you to, the, the way that you have come to conclude that that's a good reason is going to be faith. Because faith often comes up. Faith can be a methodology. Faith can be an epistemology. So I'd like you to use that. So I'll leave these up on the screen during the five minutes. Um, before we start, one last thing. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, at the end of this, oh, I know what I was going to say. For some people, this is like a nightmare scenario. This is the last thing you want to do is engage in a conversation with a stranger, and I understand that. So if you want, I'm going to give you an out. If you want to be a, a, like a passive listener, we're going to break into teams of two, but if you want to be like a third wheel and just sit there and listen and then be available to answer questions if somebody's stuck, or maybe you're like, oh, why is he not asking this question? It's so easy. You know, you might want to be like, are you stuck? I can help you out. Uh, so let's do that. I'm going to set a timer for five minutes, break into teams of two, and then we're going to start with the first one about ghost existing. Okay, that's been five minutes. Now let's switch where you have a chance to be the questioner if you were the person making the claim. So switch roles now. And the topic, the claim is God exists. Okay. All right, everybody. 
This is one of the toughest exercises to recover from afterwards because people usually get very animated and engaged in it. So thank you for participating in that. I really appreciate you, all of you doing that. Great job. All right. So um, what, what I want to ask you a couple questions about the role play and then maybe during the Q&A, like, I got a couple more slides and then you can come up, we'll have a microphone or maybe raise your hand, I guess, and we'll, we'll bring it to you. And you can ask me questions that, you, that came up during the role play, if that's the case. But um, one thing that I, uh, tell me if you noticed this. If you were the person, if you were the person making the claim either about ghosts or God, did at any point, at any point did you feel like you were being attacked by the person asking questions? Generally, no? Okay, yeah, that's usually the case. Did you feel listened to? Yeah, yeah. Did you feel like you were being misrepresented? Like your point, were, was your point being misrepresented? Okay, good. So kudos to the people who asked those questions because that's the point. We wanna to listen to a person, we wanna hear them out, we wanna completely understand what they say because if we're misrepresenting them and they come to doubt that, then that's not helping anybody, right? We wanna figure it out and it might be true Maybe ghosts are real, or maybe there is a God. So let's hear them out and be open to that possibility. Um, that, uh, that worksheet is a gift for you guys to take. You can, you can practice that in the car or whatever, or take a picture of it, put a reminder on your phone, whatever, and maybe practice it later. Um, the other thing I was gonna say is, oftentimes when we, when we reflect back on that, on that um, oops, there we go. When we reflect back on the role play, I'm curious how many people had more difficulty being the person making the claim as opposed to the questioner. So show of hands, was it harder to be the person making the claim? Half the hands maybe? Who, who felt it was harder asking the questions, coming up with the questions? It's about even. Let me just tell you, the questions come to you. The more that you practice this and do this, you'll get more proficient at it and sometimes you, you can even watch a video. People have told me this. They'll watch street epistemology videos and they hear somebody make a claim or say something during the conversation and they pause the video and they write down the question that they would ask and then they hit play. It's a really good way to learn it. And the question that you've come up with is, could be better than the one that you end up hearing. So just, don't just like say, oh, my, my question was bad. It might actually be better than what we're doing. So please, if you can, try to practice this later. Maybe look for an opportunity during the convention when somebody says something like, oh, the dinner starts at seven o'clock today, or, oh, they have a discount. <laughs> they have a discount. The restaurant across the street has a discount for people 65 and older. Oh, what do you mean by discount exactly? Well, I don't know. Why do you think that's the case? I overheard in the elevator. Is that a really good reason to think that that's true? I'm not sure. The point is, is that you can use this method for all sorts of stuff. You can use it on the basics, use it on the easy stuff. Take it home and bring it to your loved ones and you don't have to challenge a person about God. You can challenge them on very safe topics and teach them the tool so that they can use it on their own claims. There's a huge amount of resources in the six years that we've been doing this. There are presentations. This might be the, there might be one or two workshops of street epistemology like this online. Generally they're conducted in, in person and not recorded but there's a website where you can go. There's a community, like I mentioned before. There's a Facebook group where people are engaging in these conversations, not on a camera. They're not recording it. They're having them. One guy actually made a post. Him and his brother have been having arguments with their dad about God. One brother learned this method. The other brother has been debating. And the father commented how nice it was to talk to the brother <laughs> who's using the street epistemology approach. So anyways, there are people who are using this in a variety of different ways. They're sharing their stories. They're sharing their and they're having questions too. I've got this situation. The Mormons are coming over next week. What do I do? So you can, you can um, it's a really great resource. And there's also an app that you can put on your phone if you do a search for Atheos, A-T-H-E-O-S on Android and iTunes. I think you can download that. There's a, a book that started this all that I mentioned, the toolkit. So if you are an American Atheist regional director or state director, this is a resource that will be available to you. And uh, we also have a, um, what do we call it? The, uh, the study guide? I think we call it like a study guide where it's several people who have been engaging in conversations for years wrote something down too that's on the website. So the resources are out there available to you today to learn this. 
And I'm, I'm a big fan of the videos. Like there are many people from around the world now uploading content. And if this isn't even something that you would do, but you like what we're doing, watch a video, give, give those people feedback on what they can do better and help us grow it, help us get better at this. All right, well, we made it to the Q&A portion of the talk. This is, in my view, the funnest part. It looks like I've got about 34 minutes. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time for a Q&A, but we'll probably go by quick. So um, if you can, please, it, it's been said before, but try to keep your question to a question, keep it brief. Try to formulate it as if you were making a tweet with a question mark at the end of it. And if you are a little shy about asking your question here, that's fine. We are tabling out there. Uh, we've got Todd and, and Chris have been volunteering uh, for the table. So stop by the table. I think we have a few free t-shirts left. Uh, I see some hands going up, so let's get the microphone around. Okay. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask you real quick, um, given your expertise with the way you ask, ask the questions, has anyone ever gotten angry at you when you just pressed and peeled the layers off the onion and they, they realized that maybe their deeply held beliefs were being really challenged? You weren't attacking them, but you were making them realize something about themselves that they didn't want to admit and they just got angry at you and just stormed off. Has that, has that ever happened? Has, has, yeah, have you, I think the question is something like, when you use this approach, have you encountered people who are getting angry at the questions that you're asking? You're digging a little too deep, maybe, and they're getting uncomfortable. Yeah, it, it can happen. The more that you do this, though, I think you get a better sense of when they're being uncomfortable, which is okay. But when they cross the line into being like perturbed and angry, <laughs> don't go there. Like, it's not going to be helpful to anybody if they get upset. But you do want to challenge them to the point where they, they become a little uncomfortably comfortable. So um, sometimes, in the instances where people got angry, it's where I kept the conversation going far too long. This approach works in good short little bites. Uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, oops, just lost the mic. <laughs> Test, okay, there we're, we're back. Five minutes, 10 minutes, that's all you need. Just have short, brief little conversations, and the more people that learn this, like, you might be the third person to come along using this approach, and they're further along than, than anyone could have expected. So um, it can happen, but it's usually because I'm not paying attention to, to how much progress we're making. And I want to like, it's, you, get, you get excited when you hear people thinking, like you, when you see people really thinking and it's never happened before when you're asking them questions and they're really processing something deep and profound, you want to keep going. Try to resist that urge and end it on a, on a very thoughtful note and give them a way to contact you later. And you'll avoid that. So I can't see hands, so I'm going to leave it up, up to you, Silas, to pick up. When is it not advisable to use SE, like, say, Ooh. for an older person who's entrenched in their God belief? Great question. The question is, when is, a, when is it a good time to not use this approach? And there are times. There are times where I've ended the talk because the person seemed particularly uncomfortable, where their worldview would be shattered. They, they might harm themselves or other people. And they meant it. They weren't just saying that just to throw me off. But they're like, yeah, I, I've been dealing with depression for the last 12 years, and, and medicine isn't doing it, and it's only the blood of Jesus that gets me through it. I'm not going to really press that one, honestly. So um, that might be one instance. Young, young kids, I probably wouldn't do it. I might try to spend time with our parents rather than, than children. Um, that being said, if I run into a, a college-age person or a middle school, or maybe, not middle school, maybe a high schooler, I'll probably ask peripheral questions, not drill down too deep. So it, it could be a little tricky. I wrote a blog post. It's on the Street Epistemology website. It's called When to Abstain from Using Street Epistemology, and I give some reasons, what, you know, instances where you might want to back off on it. I wouldn't just back off on it if somebody's older, though. We might have a tendency like, oh, they're 90 years old, they're 80 years old. I don't, wanna, I don't really, really want to challenge that person. Why not? Like, if they value truth and they are open to questioning, figure that out first. And maybe they're not, you know, on their deathbed or something. <laughs> they're still voting. They're still, they have kids. They have grandkids. They're, they're still engaging with the population, and it could be really useful to question people even if they're old. All right, next question. Um, so have you ever encountered somebody who, after you've talked to them, uh, their confidence level went up? And not just like one point, but like significant, enough. 
And then what was the reason? What was that why or how that they gave? I don't care if it was about God or whatever the claim was. What was the how or why? And of course, I'd like to know what claim they were talking about too. I have had people. I think I have had people report that they've moved up in their confidence. It's not usually about God. Um, sometimes they do self. This is a self-reported number. To be clear, it, it could be inaccurate, subjective, like I mentioned. And yeah, maybe they report. Sometimes I think though maybe they're reporting a higher number because they're recognizing that they're being challenged and they don't like that, and then uh, they're sort of resisting it and reporting a higher level. I was telling somebody earlier, like, street epistemology works really good when you have an honest interlocutor who values truth. If you have those two things, when you use this approach, it's, it's like a hot knife through butter. Like, you'll really make huge progress with a person. So, yeah, some people have, but here's the thing, it, it, lowering a person conf, person's confidence isn't really the goal, I don't think. It can be, maybe, if they're believing something that's not true. But it's more about, I think, Letting a person hear their argument back to them so they can evaluate it to see if it, if it holds the weight that they're putting on it, right? And then they can go home like those two ladies in the video. You know, that we gave them, that was a great experience where they can go back and think about it and start processing it and maybe using it in, in other aspects of their life. So, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so my organization does weekly street tabling at Central Park, and so we're sort of at the crossroads of the world over there, and uh, we're the New York City atheists, and uh, so, you know, we go out and we talk to all different kinds of people, and I find that because I'm very emotionally invested in the, the progress and the process of secularization and the merits of humanism. Did you, did you ever find yourself being stressed out or, like, getting angry or upset just in your own personal self in the process of epistemology. Okay, uh, number one, just let me touch on real quick. If you are doing like table, if you're doing outreach efforts with your clubs, uh, I highly recommend trying to incorporate this into it. There's probably one or two members in your group who are already familiar with this. Be that person to say, I'm gonna try to do a little street epistemology and tell, tell your, your, your colleagues what you're doing so they don't step on those pauses that are happening and, and providing them with evidence and here's a contradictory Bible verse. They can completely sabotage your whole effort. Um, and the other part of that, do I ever get upset at myself? Was that? Oh, does it stress me out? Sometimes it can stress me out when you, yeah. It, maybe it's more like I get a little weary. It's like time and time again, you hear these very confident believers and they don't have a good reason for thinking that it's true. And they cause so much difficulty for, for, for humanity. So that, that could be a little frustrating. Like, oh, you know, they're so confident. They really think that this is true, but they have no good reason. And the method that they use to get there is unreliable. So it can get a little frustrating and tiresome. But uh, I, I try to remind myself that this may have been the first time that they've even asked themselves this. I've talked to 80-year-old people on the trail where they were never asked why they think their God is real or how they concluded that it's true. And that's, that's a shame. So um, I try to give them a little bit of a break. It kind of goes back to the empathy thing. You really, you really start to develop an empathy, like a, a realization that people, we're all pretty much in the same boat regarding the things that we think are true. And once you have that and you remind yourself of that, then it, I, I really don't find myself getting too frustrated anymore. Oh, yes. Couple of, is this on? Okay. A couple of quick questions. One is, how much do you feed back what they say? Like, what I just heard you say was this. That's one question. And the other is, when you're asking the questions, how much in your mind are you trying to gauge progress? In okay. air quotes. So, two part question, which my memory is so bad. So, I, uh, huh. okay. So, I think the first part was, See, I almost forgot the question. Yeah, repeating it back. I do like to repeat it back, but not to the point where you're being like an echo machine, because then it might come across as condescending. So don't do it too much, and only do it. Like, if, if they're saying something really confusing and they spent three minutes to formulate it, I say, if you don't mind, I'm gonna repeat that back just to make sure we're on the same page. Is that okay? Get consent. They say, sure, and you give it to them. And they might be like, oh, well, that's exactly what I said, but it sounds weird when you said it that way. 
Or they say, well, yeah, that's good, but let's tweak this one little word. So you can probably do it as much as you want, but maybe not to the point where it becomes so redundant and condescending, where maybe you're, you know, they think that you're just you're uh, belittling them by doing it. So just be careful with that. Tell me the second part. I'm sorry. Ah. In, in your head, am I trying to measure the progress of my conversation? I don't think so. I like that pause. That wasn't. I wasn't faking that either. Like I don't. I don't know. I don't think I'm measuring the progress. I, I guess I'm more listening to what they're saying and figuring out if uh, if they're thinking about it, if I'm understanding what they're saying, if they're understanding what they're saying, and then maybe looking for a really good point to exit on, like a really reflectful pause. Like I've never thought about it like that before. Do I really think that that's true? It, it's my gosh. Then I might end it there. So, yeah, it's maybe not, not, yeah, probably not doing that. We've got 20 minutes left. My goodness. This is good. Yes. Okay, so, so uh, I just wanted to thank you for, for this workshop. It's uh, very instructive. Uh, I have seen some of your older videos, and uh, I'll, I'll go back and revisit uh, what you've lately posted. Um, our five minute uh, role playing was excellent, um, I, but I just don't think it was enough time for us to learn a lot. So, yeah. so maybe uh, can you perhaps highlight how you end your interviews or your uh, interactions with people mm. and maybe a couple methods to, to end those conversations in a, in a still respectful and polite way? You want to know how I end, how, how I usually wrap up conversations with people? Yes. Yeah, just a little comment on the role play. Yeah, five minutes is, is, is not enough time, but I'm trying to balance. Um, dumping a lot of material on you, giving you a little bit of exposure and not keeping it too crazy chaotic. Um, I guess I sort of just look for opportunities where they're really thinking about the view or if it seems like they're getting agitated and I've crossed the line from uncomfortable comfortableness to agitation, then I'll probably end it. Or um, sometimes there's a natural break in the conversation where the phone rings or they have to go to an appointment and it just ends. Or maybe then they're like, well, what do you think about this, Anthony? Where do you stand on this claim? And then I'll just use that as an opportunity to tell them my view. Uh, so you, I guess you just sort of look for natural points to end it. And uh, what I, one thing that I do, though, I, I try to take notes when I have a conversation with somebody. I try to jot down some notes if I see them again. Like what, we, what we talked about, what they were really thinking about the most, and then uh, try to pick it up there if I meet them again. Good question. Is that it? No, no, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, uh, I think one of the indicators of uh, the success of SE is a couple sites I've seen come up that have the anti-street epistemology or the, the res how do you respond to epistemology mm. type sites. I was wondering if you've seen some of those and, and uh, what do you think of them? Okay, so I think the comment was something along the lines of, I'm noticing people commenting about SE or worrying about it. Um, coming up with ways to circumvent it, perhaps even. And maybe that's actually a way of, of saying, like, you're being successful at that. Possibly. I mean, um, I mean I've, I've had conversations with a two dozen students and people on the trail, like students at a university and people on the trail, where we talked about beliefs, including God's, and one or two conversations, sometimes three, and they don't believe it anymore. They've, they've embarked on a journey of exploration to say, are those good reasons? Do I have a good method? What would my life be like without this? And they're not believing it anymore. And that information is getting back to people who are members of, the, they, they, they were members of the same Christian on campus ministry group that they were a part of. So just a little side note, I suppose. I, I am seeing, it's interesting. I'm kind of getting, I'm getting two messages here. There is a couple, lately I've been going to a, a college university and there are some members of these groups that are, they're actively telling the students uh, of this particular group not to talk to me because they're unprepared. You're okay to believe it, but you're not competent enough to defend it, which is a little, a little strange. Now, I don't push it. I don't, I don't like say, well, you must talk to me or anything like that. So that's a little interesting. She said it's interesting because it's not your fault at all. It's their fault. And yeah. So I don't really push it too much, but... Um, on the, core, like the other side of the coin is that there are some on-campus Christian ministries that, like three weeks ago, I gave a talk to the Secular Student Alliance in San Antonio, Texas. 
And there were 10, we invited them. There were 10 members of a, of a Christian apologetics group that came. And one of the people, she's an author, she's writing an apologetics book, and she made a Facebook post, and uh, she friend requested me, and I saw it. It said something like, I sat there for 50 minutes to listen to this guy, and at no point did he say anything that I disagreed with. We have to embrace questioning. We have to embrace, we need, we need to come up with good reasons for thinking that this is true. So I'm getting mixed messages. But yeah, in short, um, there are a lot, of, a lot of people worried about what we're doing. Yeah, I, it might be an indication that we are being successful at this, yeah, possibly. Anyone else? Oh, a few more questions. Great questions too, by the way. Do you set a timer that dings or do you, <laughs> how do you time it? Okay, how do you time your encounters? Yes, uh, I, I have a timer. A lot of people that go out and do the street version of street epistemology usually have like a timer. I set a timer for four or five minutes. Sometimes I even forget to set the timer. It's not intentional, I'm not, you know, I think people will be more apt to stop if they see that you have a timer. You know, they're like, oh, it's not gonna be too long. But what's interesting, like when the timer beeps, and it does beep, I barely notice it, and the person that I'm talking to usually does, but they're like, oh, that's okay, just let's keep going. They're having fun, just like the conversation with those two ladies. They were enjoying it. It was a really fun exchange. So, and the last thing on the timer, it could be really a useful tool. Like if you're talking to somebody and they're being very dogmatic and closed, and antagonistic, and that beep, you know, that timer beeps, I'm like, okay, I think it's time to move on, and I'll move on to somebody else. It's a better use of my time to talk to somebody who's open. And real quick, how do you end the interview? If, if you're ending it, how do you end it? How do I end the interview? I mean, I guess I kind of talked about this already, but uh, yeah, either the timer will beep or there, it seems like we've reached a point, like a natural, I try to end it on like a, a reflectful moment where I've asked them a question, they thought about it, and like, I don't know if I can think that this is true or that was really cool, I wanna send my friends over to talk to you. So try to look for just for a natural ending point. Hi, Anthony. Uh, I had a question about, um, I'm really good at the trying to get somebody to explain, like, oh, what do you mean by this? But it's really hard when people get a little um, ambiguous with their answers, like, well, this is different for everybody, or this is my personal experience, and I have a feeling that I can't really mm -hmm. name. Like, um, particularly, I think, with maybe crystals, like, oh, this will affect you in a way that you'll be able to, you know, so how do you kind of help them define that so you can have, like, a more concrete conversation? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, so I, I think in short is you can run into people who will just go on and on and maybe be, just be very vague about what it is that they think is true. I might say something like, you know, I've, I've been listening really closely for, like, the last 10 minutes, and I think I would have a hard time writing out exactly what you think is true. And I'm really sorry, it's my fault, you know, put it on yourself. I'm really sorry that that's the case. Can you help me better understand what it is you think is true or what's the real reason why? And you can, in a polite way even, you know, just kind of circle back. And if they go on for another 10 minutes, you're like, you know, I'm still not, I'm still not getting it, I'm really sorry. How can we boil this down to a very simple truth claim statement? And give an example, say, so for example, ask me if I think that there's a God. And they ask you, and I'll say, no, I don't think that there's a God. And then, I, now I'm gonna ask you the same question, okay? Okay, do you think that there's a God? And that will probably give a very concise answer because you've modeled that for them. So you can try that too. Great questions. Have you ever been um, accused of uh, planting seeds of doubt as an agent of the devil? Mm. <laughs> Good question. Have I ever been accused of planting seeds of doubt as an agent of the devil? Probably, but I'm not aware of it. Maybe the closest, I think the closest that I've come to that, not necessarily like being accused of being the devil or whatever, but um, there's a video on my channel called Obey or Stay Away with a, an on-campus minister who has been apparently, I think, warning his people not to talk to me, and I, I asked him about it. We talked for like 30, 40 minutes. I think he's probably worried about that, but he never explicitly stated it, yeah. which is kind of sad, right? Well, the way that I've been dealing with the way that I've been dealing with um, situations where like others are being warned not to talk to me is I still go out and talk to people, and there are constantly students walking by at my at my current location, 
and they're noticing really friendly dialogues and the people are laughing and smiling and we're shaking hands, I'm giving them this gift. There's a buzz on campus about what I'm doing and I, most of it's positive. So I'm thinking about like, well, you know, if that population won't talk to me, that's fine, but let me just talk to the people that do and maybe they'll notice and maybe they'll come over. And again, if they've been warned not to talk to you about God, that's fine. I'll talk to you about anything else. You wanna talk about Trump or gold or guns, gender? We can talk about that. And they may go back to that group saying, I just had this great talk with this guy about karma. And I never quite thought about it this way before. And, and that, that could be a way in as well. Okay, uh, during our role play, I found myself where I had two competing lines of questioning that I uh, could choose to go down. And I'm curious, uh, if you find yourself in that situation, how do you decide which one is gonna lead to the more productive conversation? Ooh, that's tough. So you, let's say you, you, you're thinking about two possible questions to ask, how do you decide what to choose? I don't know if I have an easy answer to that. I just pick one, see where it goes, and if, if you hit a dead end, you're like, eh, that, was, that was probably a poorly formed question. You mind if I try it again and then try your second one? Go ahead. Uh, do you ever use this method to try and learn about a topic that you don't already have an opinion about? To do what? I missed it. To ask someone to explain something to you that you don't already have an opinion about, to actually learn from someone else? I missed, I'm so sorry, I missed it again. Can you talk a little louder? Sorry, do you ever use this questioning method to uh, learn from someone else about a topic that you don't already have a position on? Mm, that's a good one. Yeah, this could be really useful. So you, you meet an expert. This is kind of the funny thing about this approach is that the less you know about a topic, the, the more proficient you might be with it because you might have less of a tendency to argue Bible verses if you're like a biblical expert or, hey, you know what, I wanna to talk to some Muslims and, and uh, you know what, I don't have to study anything about the Quran. Let them, let them do the work, let them tell. So um, yeah, I think it could be useful for grasping a topic. It could also be good, there's a lot of people who are in the, the street epistemology community who they actively seek out other people who know this approach to challenge them on their own views. Can you help me kick the tires on my own view? I th I'm thinking about voting for Bernie, but I want someone to push back on that a little bit. Can you SE me on that? So that happens a lot in the communities. So it can go both ways, yeah. Uh, hello, my name's Dustin. And uh, during, when we were uh, talking, doing the, the two-person thing, um, she basically said that her belief in God was very subjective and I was trying to subtly steer her towards an objective reality through my questioning. Do you recommend that? Because it's always easier, I think, if, if you can get them to on some objective grounds. But if they're, if they're all subjective, then it's, it makes yeah. it a lot more difficult. Excellent, excellent. I'm so glad that you asked that question. One of the biggest, well, the, one of the biggest roadblocks to effective street epistemology and possibly the biggest threat to humanity, I think is relativism and this idea that, hey, if I just think it's true, it's true. Being this subjective, this idea, this idea of subjective truth can be very problematic in a variety of different ways. And even when you're questioning somebody why they think God is real. So the very, very common people say, I think Jesus is real, but you know what? The person who thinks Vishnu is real and Allah is real and God is love, they're all right too, meaning they're all correct also. It's hard to do a what, why, how drill down when somebody thinks that truth is relative. So lately we've been going out, we were giving them the way to the table. We have these little box of candies where we, we participate in a thought experiment. Sometimes very, what's one of the first things we do is say, hey, before we get into your topic, do you mind if we just do a quick little thought experiment? Do you think that the total number of pieces of candy in this container is either even or odd? and it can't simultaneously be both. Now, sometimes I've spent 30 minutes on that one. <laughs> sometimes people will be like, even, and I'm, I'm not asking to you to take a guess, is it either even or odd at the total number of pieces? And if they, they eventually come around, usually, <laughs> to saying, well, yes, if I thought that there was even in there and you thought that there was odd, there's clearly an answer to it. And if we counted them up and we came up with an even number, then the person who thought that there was an odd number in there is mistaken. Okay, even if somebody says it's their own personal truth, well, yeah, even in that situation, there's the fact of the, of the matter and then there's a person's opinion or preference. 
Once you get that buy-in, then you can shift gears. But sometimes we just assume that people think truth is objective, and then you're like 30 minutes into a conversation, then they throw that one on you. Don't keep talking about Jesus, okay? Go back to like some, uh, some sort of thought experiment. I have a blog post on the website. It says something like, um, encountering relativism when using street epistemology, or something to that effect, where we talk about this issue. And then a few examples. There's actually a video example at the table where I meet a woman on the trail and she goes that route and I do a, something really simple and funny and she immediately recognizes it and she's like, oh, okay, yeah, that would just be crazy to think truth is, truth is relative. We have, we have eight more minutes left. I'm loving the questions, by the way. Thank you for staying and asking these. It's great. So, uh, hello, my name is William. Uh, what is the most substantial criticism of street epistemology as a method that you've mm. come across? One of the most substantial criticism that I've seen so far is that, is this substantial or not? The one that I hear the most that might have some merit is, is um, I'm, I'm torn on this one, honestly. The, the complaint is you're, you're picking on people who aren't ready or prepared for this. And on one hand, I'm of the position, well, if they think that it's true and that they have a high degree of confidence that it's true and they're acting out on it, then they should be able to explain why they think that's the case. However, um, there may be some people who just, they've never really thought about it, you know, and, and you can really cut through it pretty quickly. So I'm, I'm kind of of two positions there. Um, there's no reason why you can't use this approach with a more seasoned believer or somebody who's, uh, you know, very knowledgeable about using guns on campus or whatever the topic is. You can still use these techniques, the, these, this approach. It just might take longer because they're going to be throwing up lots of different reasons that may not actually be the reason why they're that confident that's true. That's probably the first thing that might come. Maybe the second thing, I'm, I'm actually in the process of writing a blog post on common misconceptions and criticisms of SE. Uh, there's a slew of them, but they're, they're usually not that big of a deal. Yeah. That being said, we're open to criticisms. We want, we want people to poke holes in this. We want to grow, and the way that we're going to grow is, um, is getting feedback and criticism and challenging the people who are doing this. Now let us know what, what you're worried about. We created a Facebook group called Critique Street Epistemology for that very reason. Yeah. Okay, I think I've got uh, one, time for one more question, then we'll wrap it up. How different is your method now compared to what it was when you read Bogosian's book? Damn. Good question. <laughs> I hope Pete's not watching this. Uh, I, mean, I mean, how much have you learned? It's a, it's a great, no, it's, it's a great question. I'm just thinking about it. Don't step on the pause, man. I'm thinking. <laughs> Um, I think it's changed a lot since the book. Like, I'll listen to the audiobook and the examples, and I'm like, ooh, I don't know if I would have asked it that way. But the thing is, we wouldn't be where we are today with, like, three-fifths of this group knowing what street epistemology is if it wasn't for the book and people going out and doing it and finding what was a good idea and what was not so good of an idea. Like, a good example, I think, is faith. Like in the book, the author defines it in a couple of different ways. And now I think most people who are doing this have a tendency to ask the person to define that word. Tell me what you mean by faith first before we go any further. And then we accept their definition. So that's just like one small example of probably two dozen things where boots on the ground, people going out and having talks and reporting back to the communities that are there have taken this light years ahead of the book. And I think the author recognizes too. We're, we're good friends and he's in the process. I think he's even already written it. There's a second book coming out I think it's coming out in September of this year, where it's like a part two, talking about all the things that, that he's learned and we've learned as, as practitioners of this method. So yeah, I think it's come a long way. And I think in another five, six years, it will come a lot, lot further. All right, everyone, thank you very much. Really appreciate it.